Dear colleague, welcome to this PCR webinar sponsored by Boston Scientific and entitled Protect Ever Impact on Clinical Practice. Indeed, we had recently the result of this very important study assessing the benefit of cerebral embolic protection during all TAVI procedure. My name is uh, Thomas Cuisset. I'm working in Marseille, France, and I'm very happy to have a great team of colleagues and friends today with me, with Mohamed Abdelwad from Germany, Lars Sandergaard from Denmark, and Johanna Vikrikowska from Netherlands. Just to share with you, the, the learning objective we'd like to achieve together during the next uh, 60 minutes is first to try to understand how to interpret the protect Aver result in a practical manner to reflect our clinical practice, and then to address the role of cerebral embolic protection in lifetime patient management for TAVI, and of course, focusing on the periprocerebral benefit of the Sentinel device. To achieve these learning objectives, we build this agenda. So after a short introduction, we will start with the straightforward case, highlighting the the use of the Sentinel device in a regular TAVI case. And after we will dive deeply into the result of the Protectiver study recently presented and published in the New England. And from this result, we'll try to reflect how to integrate that into our practice. And to focus on that, first we will have two cases with presentation of the Sentinel device in more challenging situation. And as you will see, not all all TAVI patients were included in the Protect Aver study, and that will be important point to discuss. And then, of course, the final thing to do is to try to see how to implement the Sentinel as part of a modern TAVI program. Indeed, we are treating younger patients, longer life expectancy, and of course, the stroke prevention is key in this patient. So I already presented the, the team we will work together during these 60 minutes. But of course, one of the most important part of the team is you, meaning the, the colleague we are connected with us uh, today. And to discuss that, we have a chat master. We will exchange with you during the, the entire webinar but it will also transmit to us, let's say the key question that we will address during the discussion. And to help us for that, we have the pleasure to have with us uh, Sebastian Elvinger. Just as a very short introduction and following my conflict of interest, we try to start thinking about the rationale for the use of cerebral embolic protection during TAVI intervention. The first point, it's very clear that brain injury is quite frequent after TAVI intervention. It's between 3 and 4% of clinical stroke if we look at the different studies and registries. But if you don't have the cardiologist, but if you have the neurologist, the rate might go up to, to 15. And if we do systematic MRI after TAVI, we know that we will observe up to 80% of subclinical stroke, but of course, it might impair the clinical prognosis of the, of the patient. So brain injury is frequent after TAVI, but interestingly, as you can see on this, on this paper, it's mainly occurs during the procedure. So the period where the patient really need a strong protection is the procedure itself. And when we do cerebral embolic protection, in almost all cases, you will get something in your basket. So there is clearly brain injury, and when we try to protect the brain, we always capture something. So the rationale for the use of embolic protection device is really strong. But still, we need some clinical evidence to support the use of uh, cerebral embolic protection, and namely, in this case, the Sentinel device. So what was the evidence before 2022 and publication of Protectaver results? Before that, we had no individual study showing clinical benefit for stroke reduction. 
but we had indirect evidence, meaning we had meta-analysis suggesting significant benefit of the embolic protection device for the stroke prevention in patients undergoing TAVI. But of course, we know that meta-analysis will not be enough to guide our practice, so there was a clear need for a large randomized controlled trial. And that's why the protect TAVER study have been designed years ago and presented and published very recently. And really the idea of the webinar is to see how from an important study publication, we might change our practice. And to link the whole discussion we will have together and with you, uh, and to, to link that with the, the clinical practice, we will start with this webinar with a, a case presentation of the use of the Sentinel device in routine case, as we could say. So Mohamed, floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Thomas. And, and this case really just is an example um, from the study. Uh, we enrolled a, a big number of our patients uh, in the study, and it was really a very straightforward and pragmatic a clinical trial that allowed us to integrate it into our daily routine. Of course, with a few exceptions we will be talking about later, but this case demonstrates um, how we integrated the study in our routine practice. Um, and this case, as you can see here, is an 84 years old lady with symptomatic severe AS with no significant coronary artery disease and some comorbidities reflecting um, her um, um, age, uh, such as AF and peripheral arterial disease, chronic kidney disease, and she also was uh, treated for breast cancer followed by irradiation. So more or less a usual um, old lady that is being uh, considered or treated uh, um, for her severe AS. You can see her on CT. Um, an anatomy that is suitable for transfemoral TAVI, nothing special, a um, little bit of tortuosity in her aorta, a valve that is moderately symmetrically calcified. Um, and this case was actually um, done uh, during uh, a live interventional meeting uh, a little bit more than a year ago. Um, we decided in her case for a transfemoral axis, um, and for an accurate valve, uh, we wanted to do this with commissural alignment. And the question about embolic protection during the trial was for us more or less easy. We didn't have to choose, but we included the patient in the trial and she was randomized to the uh, Sentinel arm. And on, on the next slide, it's just a video from this live case demonstration showing you the implantation of this device. Sentinel device. And you will see here that we already have uh, a 0.14 inch wire in the ascending aorta. We are coming with the system. This is a more or less straightforward anatomy for the sentinel device. So no big tortuosities here in the uh, cerebral vessels. We are going now to place the first filter in the brachiocephalic trunk. And then withdraw the wire a little bit, also withdraw the pigtail a little bit. We usually do this now without an angiogram as we used to do in the past because if you know the vessels from the CT, then you don't need to do a lot of angiograms. Of course, you can do if you need them. Then we'll try, we think we are now approaching the uh, left common carotid, so we're in there. So we'll now we'll place the second filter after optimizing device position a little bit. So now we place it. Johannes will draw a little bit on the wire. And now we're there. So if you um, um, had a look or if you noticed the, uh, the, uh, the, the time uh, of device uh, placement, you may have noticed that this was more or less one minute. Um, and I think this is one of the advantages of this device why we like it from an interventional pers perspective. We will discuss the data in detail, but it's easy to learn and execute. Uh, it took us one minute to place it in a straightforward anatomy. If you add 
the um, the axis, uh, the radial axis, which is the most common axis we use um, for this device, then you may add maybe one or two other minutes. So it doesn't add a lot of burden to the procedure. And this is, I think, an important point. This um, procedure went fine with a good valve function. We didn't notice macroscopic material in both filters and the patient didn't have neurological complications. Um, and with that, I return back to you, Thomas, um, if you want to discuss or move forward. Yes, yeah, thank you, Mohamed. I think it's a, it's a great illustration. As you say, during the, the protect Tower study, life was quite easier because we just had to randomize to decide to use the device or, or, or not. But uh, I, we had a, a, just a question from uh, somebody. You, I had exactly the same experience that you share. It means that it's something just it takes two minutes. And uh, especially in straightforward anatomy, when the CT screening has been uh, has been done, I think that's also a, a key message to say that for like for TAVI, I mean for the cerebral embolic protection, the the CT analysis is really key. What was your learning curve? I think the question from our colleagues was to how many cases did you do before feeling really comfortable with the device? Yeah, I mean, I will guess now because I don't remember. We started long ago, but I would say you would need maybe like around maybe 10 to 15 cases to feel um, at ease. Um, and of course, like everything else, if you do more uh, and start to do challenging cases as well, then you will even feel more comfortable, of course. But I think like the first 10 cases was the one um, where you had to learn a little bit how to use the device in which direction. And afterwards, you refine your technique and you refine your experience as well. Yeah, thank you, Mohamed. So, Joana, also a, a question. Uh, Mohamed mentioned already the, the anatomy and, uh, and the CT. And so what is the, the proportion of patients suitable for the use of the, of the Sentinel device? And what are the, the, the key anatomical uh, limitations? So I think 95% of our patients are able to get successful placement of uh, Sentinel. Um, the biggest problem that we have is sometimes that patients come for uh, coronary angiography or PCI beforehand, and then their radial, right radial artery is occluded. Um, and the other two components are Lusoria, which is obviously an anomaly where you cannot place the device. Um, and that's actually it. Um, there are sometimes extremely tortuous anatomies and calcium inside of the blood vessels, which prevent you from placement of the device. But um, most of the time, it's fairly easy. It's easy also in the bovine arch, uh, and it's easy with some tortuosity. So it's quite easy to do. It's suitable for almost all the patients. So Lars, I think it's... Uh, it's time to, to look at the evidence to see if we can support uh, this uh, easy device to use in most of our patients. And I think that's the time we can start reviewing the, the product of our results. Okay, thanks, Thomas. So let's let's see this uh, the data here. So the protected tower, again, was to test uh, cerebral embolic protection using the sensor device in patient undergoing transfemoral tarpa procedures. So again, the learning objectives was to look for, it was a pragmatic design, try to look for clinical stroke, as I said, in patients who's undergoing transfemoral type of procedures, no matter what surgical risk score they had, and also no matter what transcatheter heart valve was actually used. It was prospective, multi-center, randomized controlled trials conducted in 51 centers in North America, Europe, and in Australia. So it included 3,000 patients, randomized one-to-one -one between TAVI without cerebral embolic protection and TAVI with cerebral embolic protection using the sensor. So 1,500 patients in each arm. All patients had a neurotic, neurological assessment at hospital admission and again after the TAVI procedure. So the end point was all stroke at 72 hours or discharge, whichever came first, um, so, in hospital, stroke. And um, the expectation and the study design based on a stroke rate of 4% in the control arm, which should be reduced by 50% down to 2% in the group who had cerebral embolic protection. 
So that had more than 90% power to demonstrate superiority of the Sentinel device in reducing all strokes. As I said before, 3,000 patients was included. There was also an interim analysis after 70% of the patient was enrolled, 2,100 patients. And the Data Safety Monitoring Board uh, made the decision to actually continue that point to enroll all 3,000 patients. So again, um, the stroke, it was also divided into four groups. Um, type 1A may be the most important, the one the patient who had an ischemic stroke, 1B, patient who had a hemorrhage, intercerebral hemorrhage, type 1D, which have an unspecified stroke, and 2A, convert CNS infarction. And also the, um, all the events which was adjudicated was uh, mortality, TIA, delirium, acute kidney injury, and of course, was the safe uh, device safe to implant was any access vessel complications. So this is a study flow. As I said, 3,000 patients enrolled, randomized one to one, in almost 1,500 patients in both arm. A few patients did not undergo TAB. It was nine patients in the control group and 12 patients in the TAB group. And also some patients withdraw their consent. It was three patients in the control arm and six patients in the test arm with the cerebral embolic protection. And as you can see, it was a quite high rate of pay, number of patients who could actually have the device implanted. Only 5.5% of the patients, it was not possible to implant the device. But as since it was designed as an intention to treat, these patients who was um, randomized to the test arm but did not have the device was still counting in the endpoint. So if you look at the baseline demographic, it's quite well distributed between the two groups. It's elderly patient around eight years of age. You can see also a risk score was around 3.4% with equal distribution between low, intermediate and extreme risk patients. And most of the patients have severe or extreme calcification of the aortic valve complex. The only factor which was the difference between the two groups that was more females in the test arm, in the central arm, and also we, we know that these patients are more prone to, a female patient are more prone to have a stroke. So a little bit higher risk patients in that arm, but otherwise very equal distributions between the two study groups. Most patients were done, the most patients were under the local anesthesia, about three out of four patients, the remaining 25% of the patient in general anesthesia. And if you look at the valve anatomy, around 8% of the patient had a bicuspid aortic valve, and around 3% of the patient had a type of procedure as a valve and valve procedure. The lunar expandable valve was used in two thirds of the patients. The remaining patient had a self-expanding uh, valve, and also pre dilatations was done in about 40% of the patient and post dilatation in about 25% of the patients. So coming to the outcome, the primary incoming point was all stroke at 72 hours or discharge, whichever occurred first. 2.9% in the control group reduced down to 2.3% in the central arm. So a reduction of 0.6%, but as you can see, it did not reach statistical level significance. If you look at patients who had a disabling stroke, you, which was a pre-specified secondary endpoint, and again, we missed the primary endpoint, so take that into consideration when you look at this. It came down from 1.3% in the control arm to 0.5% in the center lab, so a reduction of 0.8%, which reached statistical significance, 0.02. And also, if you look at the mechanism, you can see here in patients having disabling stroke, most of these patients have a type 1A, an ischemic stroke, so the filter was really effect effective to reduce the risk of extreme strokes in these patients. And also looked at all outcomes, you see here, it's a low event rate and no difference between the two groups, all cause mortality, same rate about 0.4%, cardiovascular mortality around 0.4%, all these mortality was cardiovascular. Safety endpoint was also high. And if you look at the risk of vascular complication in the sensor alarm, you can see it was only one patient have a minor vascular complication. So once again, as Mohammed. Uh, stressed before, it's a very easy, a very safe device 
to implant. We have it also show that you can implant these devices without using contrast and also reflected here that the rate of acute kidney injury was low and the same in the two groups, 0.5% of the patient. If you look at subgroup analysis, again, remember the event rate was low, so it is difficult to show any difference in the subgroups because the event rate, of course, is becoming even lower. The only thing which was actually statistically significant was that in the US, it seems that patients undergoing TAVI using the sensor device had a lower rate of all stroke, whereas there were no different in outside of the US. So just to conclude this trial, you can see that it was a high success rate to actually to implant it. 94.4% of the patient, it was possible to implant it with a very low rate of complication. Only one patient had a minor vascular access complication. The device did not have a significant reduction of all stroke. It was 2.9% in the control arm compared to 2.3% in the sensor arm. If you look at the secondary endpoint, disabling stroke which may be more important to the patient, there was a significant reduction from 1.3% down to 0.5%, especially for patients with a type 1A ischemic strokes. And from this that was study that was not possible to uh, identify any anatomical features, which was a high risk and which indicated that there was a higher rate of reduction of all stroke using the sensor device. So what kind of clinical implication here? I mean, you see that cerebral body protection device should be considered for all patients undergoing TAVA in order to reduce the risk of disabling stroke. We can discuss later on, despite, uh, due to the very low rate of disabling stroke, number needed to treat is of course high to prevent what in this study was 125 patients which needed to be treated in order to prevent one case of disabling stroke. It was also shown that it's a very safe device to, to use. And I think what is going to dictate uh, the future for this device based on this specific study is what is the cost of these procedures. And again, here, as mentioned before, you can find uh, the full uh, paper on this study in the New England Journal of Medicine published here in September 2022. Thank you, Lars. I think that's a very clear, informative presentation. And before you give us your, your perspective on the on the study, I would like also to hear the, the view of, of Mohamed and Joanna. We have we, we have questions, but more on cases. So probably we'll come back to that, that during a Mohamed uh, presentation. Maybe Lars, two short comments. Uh, the first, we, we know that always and never is very often uh, disappointing in, in cardiovascular medicine. We we experience that, for example, with the thromboaspiration in the in, in the STEMI, and I think there is quite a, a good parallel between the between the two. And also, when we discuss about number of patients to be treated, it's true that it seems high, but uh, let's say the trauma for the patient and the family and the cost of disabling stroke is such so high that uh, we had exactly the same number of patients to treat when we tried to reduce stent thrombosis one decade ago. And finally, we changed the stent, we changed the DAPT strategy. So uh, it was just my two uh, short comment, trying to put in that result into, into perspective. Johanna, maybe you, you want to comment on the, on the main result of the, of the study? Sure, so I think uh, the problem is it's still underpowered and I am still looking forward to the meta-analysis of the big trial to capture all the things we can. Um, you know, does it, my institution, we actually do this with, in every single patient, uh, as I said, and so for now I think it probably won't change the practice uh, until we have the definitive data uh, and hopefully then it will convince us that we should continue the way that we've been doing it. In fact, we didn't randomize in your trial because we didn't want to uh, hold back the therapy from our patients. So, Yeah. And Mohamed, we know that the dramatic complication that we experience is not the stroke, it's the disabling stroke, which really is a nightmare for management of the patient, the family, and sometimes it's difficult to say, but it's sometimes for the family and maybe the patient as well, it's even sometimes worse than death because it's a, it's a long-standing process with many social implications. And do you think we can we could regret the choice of the primary endpoint 
But of course, the size of the study should have been much larger. Yeah, I mean, it's it's always disappointing, of course, uh, to see um, results of something that we were hoping that it turns out to be a clear win, uh, in this case, for cerebral embolic protection. Because, I mean, uh, at least from the um, rationale behind this technology, it's uh, appealing and convincing and it makes sense. So it's always difficult to get into this conflict between um, yeah, you may call it the, the, the heart of a clinician and then the mind of the scientist. Uh, on the other hand, we have to respect the data as they are and the trial is neutral regarding the primary endpoint and all other um, endpoints are hypothesis generating. So we're, we're not, we do not know um, for sure if we can reduce disabling strokes, but it may be like that and it makes sense. Um, and to return to your question, of course, um, now after doing the trial um, and seeing the results, we may think that, okay, the design could have been maybe a bit better. Um, maybe we overestimated the incidence of old stroke in a contemporary tower population. Um, it turned out to be lower than we thought. And maybe we focused on all strokes just to make the trial doable, more or less, in a, in, an, in a period where it was difficult to conduct trials. I mean, the trial was performed during the pandemic. And of course, doing a trial with disabling stroke as a primary endpoint would need much, much more patients. Um, so we may be regretting this now, um, um, but I mean, it, it, it still, I don't think we still have the definitive answer. Um, yeah. As you said, I think the, the final answer will be compromised, as you say, between the art of the clinician and the mind and the scientist. And I think we are both, at least I hope. So that's, uh, and maybe last question, last question to, to Lars before, uh, before moving to your, your perspective, Lars. Do you think any procedural uh, aspect in the study, for example, half of the patient had predilatation, the choice of the valve, so do you think some of the procedural aspect might have a, an impact on the result of the of the study and especially the the rate of stroke that we see it's very low in Europe compared to US for example and the overall mortality is also very very low which is a great news also Yeah we have seen during the last couple of years that next generation devices and delivery system is coming out it's it's smaller profile it's more flexible system and this locally uh, may have reduced the rate of stroke. So, so the, this, this protected time was designed based on what today could be considered as historical data. Uh, so, th so that could be one of the explanations. Thank you, Lars. Probably we can, now that we, we discussed, let's say the, the main finding of the study, I think it's good also to try to, to have a kind of perspective and to have a critical analysis of the, of the study. So maybe last you can share with us and all the people connected a few slides on the on that. Yeah, sure. You can get the slide back on. So first of all, as I said in the study design, it was assumed that there would be a stroke rate of four percent in the control arm. We only saw it was two point nine percent. And you can ask yourself why was the event rate lower than expected? I just said that could be due to newer delivery system, which are at a lower profile more flexible and thereby causing there's a, a smaller risk of stroke. But it could also be that high risk patients was not included in this study. We, before this trial, we joined the trial, it used the sensor device in all patients where it was anatomically suitable. But when we joined it, patient had the option to join the trial or treat it, be treated with, outside the trial without the use of the sensor. But again, if you look into what kind of patient came into it, as I said, it, one third of the patient was high risk patients, and also 8% of the patient in the control arm had bicuspid aortic valve, and 2.5% was treated for valve valve procedure, which I think is reflecting very much what we're doing in daily clinical practice. So I'm not sure that um, these high risk patients always was treated outside uh, the trial, and thereby you have a select, uh, patient selection bias. Also, if you look at the event rate in the test arm in the group who had uh, the sensor device implanted, you actually saw a little higher rate 
was expected to be 2% of the patient who had uh, a, any kind of stroke in the test arm, and it was actually 2.3% of the patients. So you can ask yourself, is this current generation of the sensor device, is it fully protecting the brain? And we know that there's two filters covering three out of four brain vessels. The left vertebral arteries, artery is not covered, and that can explain why. And there's also some data from a protected target trying showing that most of these type 1A lesion is actually located in the non-protected area of the brain. The brain supplied by the left uh, vertebral artery. Another perspective could be that the tribe was simply just underpowered. It actually reduced uh, the risk of all stroke coming down from 2.9% but down to 2.3%. But we simply didn't have a study which was large enough to show that. One good thing is that there's another trial ongoing, the British Heart Foundation Protect Tavi is going to randomize even more patients, 7,730 patients, once again going to be randomized one-to-one -one against Tavi with a sensor device and Tavi without a cerebral body protection device. Endpoint is the same, all stroke at 37 hours, uh, 72 hours, or a discharge who is ever coming first. The only difference here is that the patient will not be assessed by a neurologist, but very much the same study design, the same uh, endpoint here. And this study have now included about 30% of the patients. And the good thing is that where in the Europe and in the US, uh, the sense advice is actually commercially available, saying that people can actually be treated with the device outside of the study. The sense device or any cerebral and body protection mice are not reimbursed in the UK. So we can hope that all patients would actually join the trial and no one is going to be treated outside. And also, it's already been decided or planned that a meta analysis of the protected TAVA and the British Heart Foundation protected TAVA is going to be conducted when the later study is completed. So that's going to give us almost 11,000 patients included in, in, uh, in these two trials and hopefully we get better power, and this may show that there's actually a statistical significant difference with regard to all stroke using sensors or not. Another point is that you can say it's a quite high number of patients needs to be treated, 125 patients to prevent one disabling stroke. Again, it's always a matter, we do about 500 cases of TAVI in Copenhagen, so let's assume we do all use it in all these cases, we're going to prevent four cases of disabling stroke, which I certainly think will make it different from the program and for the patients and families. One of the reasons also for this high number of patients needed to be treated is that there is a very low rate of disabling stroke. That's a good thing, but it's only 1.3%. So even though you had a cerebral body protection device who was 100% efficient, would bring the rate of disabling stroke down to 0%, None at all. Again, if you say that, it still will only give you a number needed to treat of 77. You cannot bring it further down due to the low rate of disabling stroke in these patients. And finally, you can say that one thing which has not been examined by the protected TAV or and will not be by the BHF protected TAV is what is the consequence of a silent brain lesion. We know that most of these patients undergoing TAV will have these new brain lesions. And if you ask a stroke neurologist, he will say this is going to be associated with a cognitive impairment and early dementia, which of course is going to be even more critical as we move to patients at a younger age with longer life expectancy. But this was not started in this. And so we haven't have all the knowledge about the impact or the effect of these cerebral protection devices. Thank you, Lars. I think it's very uh clear and critical analysis of the of the study and try to really good perspective of, about how to use the, the study in clinical practice. We had one one question. Um, do you think the rate of the stroke observed in the Sentinel group could also be driven by the fact that some of the teams involved in the in the trial, because we know that there was many centers, were probably at the initial use of, of the device, which also might be uh, it could be one of the explanation. Yeah, again, I mean, uh, if the device is not implanted correctly or 
There's also a range of, of vessel diameter where it's actually going to work. If you work outside that, it may not capture all the debris passing through these vessels. So, yeah, of course, there will, as always, there will be a, a learning curve. Uh, this five is a quite easy device to, to, to use. Mohamed, do you have uh, any thought or view on the, uh, on the perspective on this, uh, on, on this trial and how you will modify your, your, your practice? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I like the, the, um, what, what Lars showed, that uh, the number needed to treat, even if the device is 100% perfect, uh, would be for disabling stroke 77 with the current stroke rates, which puts this number of 125, again, despite this being a secondary endpoint, a bit into perspective. It's, it's good to know that even without the device, we don't have extremely high stroke rates. Uh, but on the other hand, stroke, as Lars mentioned, is a devastating complication. And for actually for the majority of patients, it's, it does matter more, even more than death. The, the other thing um, does not reflect on changing practice, but may give the audience or the participants some insight on how the trial was executed. Uh, the presence of a neurology professional, of course, uh, was made a difference, at least in our center. Uh, these disabling strokes, these are the ones that we are like as normal, like uh, simple-minded cardiologists would see, correct? The, the minor ones, actually, we, we, we didn't see. So we were surprised during the trial that we, like I was personally surprised when I uh, was told that uh, Mr. or Mrs. Uh, X, Y had a stroke because clinically it wasn't apparent for us. But the neurologist saw something and he compared it or she compared it to the baseline neurological examination. And as you mentioned, Thomas, if you do an MRI in these patients, you will find something usually, and then it's a stroke. Um, so it, it would have been interesting to know how these minor strokes that happened during the trial in both arms would have um, reflected on the clinical course of the patients. But this is, again, one of the drawbacks of the trial, that the trial is, was very short. So we, we don't have follow-up of the patients. We only have follow-up up to 30 days of patients who had stroke, but we don't have a, a lot more follow-up and it's not going to come. And this is a drawback. And we had uh, small studies already uh, before uh, showing uh, benefit on cognitive impairment with cerebral protection with Sentinel device or others. So it's, uh, it's also because... Uh, yeah, it, it Maybe if you interpret this uh, like disabling, non-disabling stroke, it's difficult. I mean, it's not scientific what I'm saying. But if, if we're not uh, eliminating stroke, maybe we are reducing its severity, but how can we prove this? Uh, it's difficult, okay? But it would be an achievement if we don't eliminate but reduce severity. Yeah. Lars, uh, just a question from Andrea Schober asking about the pre-existing carotid disease uh, in the trial and was it well balanced between the two groups? meaning that uh, we know that there is some significant disease, we might also have a risk putting the device in it. So do we have this yeah, information? I mean, no, I don't think we have that uh, captured. I mean, again, it was, um, there was any call lab who was uh, reviewing the patients and make a decision whether the patient was eligible for the study. It was all up to the, to the local investigators to make that decision. So, so no, we don't have all these uh, uh, details. Yeah. And Joan, I think it's it's a good and, and practical question. And we discussed that with Mohamed that radial access could be a limitation, but in less than 5% of cases. But for you also, the, the carotid disease will probably be a, a limitation if you have significant one? Yeah, absolutely. I think you have to be careful there. And, uh, and indeed, it's too bad that there was not a correlation, and that we don't have all the CT scans available to analyze them back. So maybe a good transition to another point that you nicely highlight, Lars, is the fact that as any randomized control trial, usually the higher risk patients were not uh, in included and we had some exclusion criteria. Mm -hmm. So that will be a good transition with the next uh, case presentation by Mohamed. We will share with you not the, the straightforward use in your daily typical TAVI, uh, TAVI case, 
but the use of uh, of sentinel device in more uh, more challenging anatomies or clinical situation Mohamed? yes so so i'll be showing uh, two cases um and and after each case maybe i'll, I'll talk for a, for a few seconds why I, I'm, I'm showing this case in particular. So the first case you can see here, old lady with decompensated heart failure, uh, acute on top of chronic renal failure, and has a degenerated small surgical valve, uh, a trifecta 21, um, with a severe stenosis and moderate regurgitation. You can see here on CT how degenerated and calcified the leaflets are. Um, but importantly also, as we know from this particular valve, this patient had a high risk of uh, um, tower-induced coronary obstruction on both sides, actually. Here are some measurements. You can see the access vessels. And the heart team decision-making in this case was valve and valve, but with coronary protection using a, a double basilica, so slicing both leaflets, and with cerebral protection. Um, this is how the case went. You see here the placement of the sentinel, which was not challenging. Um, you see here the laceration first of the um, left cusp and then of the right cusp, followed by implantation of a self-expanding device. And fortunately, also after this double basilica, despite the high risk of obstruction, the coronaries remained patent. And this is what we usually find um, after such a complex procedure. Um, we don't have particular um, or specific data on what we find in the filter when we do leaflet laceration. But in my experience, we sometimes see like, um, like stuff that could have been the byproduct of using electro uh, surgery. Um, so like black stuff in the filter, I don't know if this is like burnt tissue or parts of the catheters, we really don't know. I'm showing this case because it, of course, it was not an exclusion criteria in protected tower to, to include valve and valve or to include basilica cases. Um, but there are very few centers that do basilica routinely. We do basilica and we didn't include these patients in the trial. Um, just because we felt that we shouldn't. I don't know if this is wrong or right, but we felt that we shouldn't. We have some registry data that show very high stroke rates in these patients, like without a neurologist examination, up to 10% if you don't use uh, in embolic protection. In our experience, we have extremely low stroke rates uh, with the Sentinel device being used in all our Basilica cases. Again, this is not science, but this is, a little bit the heart of the clinician. Uh, so these patients you will not find in the trial and it remains open whether we need to protect them or not. We do. Um, the second example, um, 80 years old female, um, clear symptomatic AS, no significant coronary artery disease on CT as you can see here. So she didn't require a coronary angiogram. And you can see here um, she has more or less a straightforward axis. But if you look closer to this valve, and this is something we learned um, um, by time, the valve is not extremely calcific, but there's a lot of thick or what we call black matter on the left coronary cusp. So this is more or less fibrotic or atheromatous material. So it is hypoattenuated. It's not hyperattenuated, it's not calcium and it seems to be very bulky and concentrated on the left cusp. Again, we don't have evidence for that, but we feel that this could increase the risk of embolism. Um, in this case, we decided to treat her with a balloon expandable valve with cerebral protection for fear of embolism from this, um, what we think is very soft tissue. This is a placement of the device, nothing, nothing in particular. You see here the implantation of the valve and during implantation, you will notice that the left cusp, um, there is, while it's the sinus is being filled with contrast, there is a lot of um, like, like some sort of a filling defect you see in the cusp uh, that is being, of course, moved upwards during implantation. And this case did not, this patient did not develop a stroke, by the way, but uh, she developed bilateral coronary embolism. 
um, and she needed stenting of both vessels. Um, it was not possible to aspirate this material from the right and from the left coronary artery. And uh, uh, she ended up with stenting. Fortunately, she was good in discharge on and she didn't have stroke. Again, this is not an evidence for anything. It's just um, to show you again what we don't know from protected tower. Um, and we don't know from protected tower, we don't know anything about the differential use in certain anatomic situations, because as you heard, we don't have we don't have a CT core labs. The CTs haven't been assessed and probably will never be been are never going to be assessed. We just have an information, a clinical information about the degree of calcification of the valve, whether the valve was bicuspid or tricuspid. But we don't have this fine information, and I think it will be difficult to know for sure at any certain time point with solid scientific evidence whether what we feel as clinicians uh, increases the risk of stroke or not. Um, but this is what, what we think. Thank you, Mohamed. V very clear. And it's, it's, it's good that you, you present very challenging case uh, in which, the, of course, the indication is uh, it probably makes more sense when you do double basilica, as you as you said. And we have just following that a question from our colleague Dr. Abdelafez, who is asking: Did you uh, experience uh, complications while putting the device in? And we've seen that in protective the rate of complication was more than low because I think only one patient experienced complications. But in your practice, our colleagues would like to know because you have very high volume center. And did you experience any, let's say, difficulties or, or complications? Um, not complications that make you think, oh, what, what, what happened? Um, so uh, the main limitation, as Joanna mentioned, is if we cannot uh, obtain access. And um, it, it could be difficult if the uh, brachiocephalic trunk is extremely tortuous. And then if you insist on placing the device, you will need to use a, maybe some tips and tricks and maybe change wires and um, if you insist on putting the device. Um, other than that, um, I cannot recall a patient, for example, that um, had a neurological incident immediately or during placement of the device. You will never be able, to, of course, to judge uh, for sure if the device can cause some embolization, but we don't see any clinical signals for that. Um, and I don't think that this um, uh, can be um, extracted from the trial as well. Um, yeah. But other than that, um, actually, it's a, the good thing about the device uh, is that when you put it, you forget about it. It's not on your way. Um, and this is not the case with other devices, which may be a bit more bulky, and then they cause, like, complications from the TAVR procedure itself because you're focused the whole time on the device where is it correct am I inside outside but with this device you just forget yeah, it's very important what you just say that there is very little interaction between THV device and the and the sentinel maybe practical question last we know that it should be placed by a right radial access so in such case you will use as control lateral access for your TAVI uh, the left radial that was also a, a question. You do be radial. Yeah, yeah we, we, you can do that. And also, I would say it's right radial access. But if you have small radial artery, you can go up to the brachial artery and put it in there in the in the right side. So, and then you use the other side for for access if you want to have your contralateral access from the from the radial artery. If you think the patient really needs to have cerebral umbilic protection, but he has a mm -hmm. As Joanna said, occlusion of the radial or very tortuous radial, you can go a little bit higher and mm -hmm. finally to put the, the protection in. Uh, Joanna, we have also a question from Dr. Negeso from Ethiopia, who is joining us tonight. So that's, that, that's great to see that we are really reaching people in, in many different places in the world. Because we discussed earlier about, the, let's say, subclinical brain injury on MRI, and he's just asking whether we should do MRI after TAVI and will this subclinical brain injury will have, let's say, any clinical implication or therapeutic uh, implication in your practice, Joanna? What will be your advice for him? 
And I think you should not be doing MRIs routinely. I mean, you, you will find the lesions, I think, uh, even uh, from crossing the valve, you will find some lesions. And, you know, I think if your patient is not having symptoms, uh, you probably won't change your uh, treatment. Yeah, I mean, if you see it, would you add a plavix to the aspirin uh, post for instance? I don't know. I don't think we don't have any evidence uh, on that. Um, so I would be, uh, I would only do those type of CT or MRI if we have uh, evidence, uh, um, symptoms of uh, stroke uh, recognized by yourself and then confirmed by the neurologist. Um, you know, uh, sure, I think that we all have this gut feeling that maybe those small areas uh, can cause some cognitive dysfunction. I mean, the MOCA uh, uh, questionnaires, I believe, were also negative in the protected TAVAR, but we all know that, for instance, post bypass post pump run, patients have this kind of feeling I'm slower than normal in my thinking. And uh, perhaps you would see that as well. But what can you do to fix it? I don't think you can do anything. Yeah. Yeah, so no, no routine MRI after, especially those days that we are trying to do everything simple and simple with the fast, fast track approach, the next day discharge. So to try to, to take time to do MRI is probably also going a little bit against the, let's say, the fast track process that we try all to implement in our, in our center. So maybe now the next uh, step will be to, to listen to you, Joanna, who will tell us how to to implement the, the, the Sentinel as part of a, of a modern uh, TAVI program in your center. And after we will discuss that to, to see the view from Lars and, and Moami. Of course. Now, so thank you for having me. Um, indeed, our center uses the device for many years now in uh, all of the cases. And I think protected Stavar has not proved us wrong or uh, has confirmed that what we are doing is correct. One thing that it did confirm for me is that if you are going to use it, use it consistently in all your patients without picking a risk category. Because we know from this uh, forest plot that you showed that there's not a particular group where it's particularly beneficial, maybe the valve and valve uh, stands out especially in um, the basilica procedures and peripheral vascular disease. But other than that, uh, I think all patients we treat are high risk. And I think the reason that uh, we use it in all patients um, is that we know, of course, that the stroke has extremely poor prognosis. Uh, I like this very much, this your intervention paper. It's a Medicare analysis by Bobier from Boston, which shows the hazard ratio of 1.67 for all cause mortality, uh, infarction, and subsequent stroke in uh, the 4% uh, of the patients in the U.S. Uh, that have tabby related stroke. Also, the costs of such a stroke per year are higher. So, uh, you know, we talk sometimes about the cost of the device, number of needed to treat and the cost of the device, but the cost of stroke is also very high. Um, and then those patients, of course, have a poor quality of life. Um, what, you, what we mentioned is this uh, cognitive dysfunction that we suspect happens with small um, uh, emboli also uh, that happen. And I think what's also important to keep in mind that when we expand to a younger population of patients, while perhaps they could have lower risk uh, of stroke because they have less PVD and they have a lower STS score, but if they do get a stroke, then they live with that stroke for many, many years to come. And the impact of a stroke in a younger patient is much more debilitating and much more costly to the society. Um, so um, the other important thing I think in your center, uh, if you have a TAVI program, is to be able to recognize the stroke, to make sure that you know the symptoms. And also, if the patient post-TAVI has a stroke, to actually manage it aggressively like you would do with any other stroke. That said, and we have a nice paper here from uh, Levy recently in Jack Intervention, uh, which shows that indeed, if you stay conservative, that the risk of uh, the mortality is uh, three times as high. 
the caveat here is that uh, strokes post TAVI are not easy to treat. Of course, we just made, uh, uh, we just put a 14 or maybe 20 French sheath, and the patient post thrombolysis has a risk of bleeding. A lot of the strokes are not caused by um, a thrombus, but rather material um, that uh, Mohammed just showed from the valve, uh, pieces of calcium. So those won't obviously lie. And, it, and the preferred strategy in our center is to send the patient to the neuroradiologist. But they also sometimes have trouble to get out um, those uh, pieces of calcium or pieces of uh, material um, out of the vessels, um, as you showed also in your uh, coronary occlusion uh, cases. Um, so, you know, these are, of course, the uh, criteria for recognizing the stroke. Um, uh, they are incorporating into uh, the ALVAC definition, obviously. But uh, just to remind everybody, it's acute episode of focal global neurological deficit um, that uh, lasts for more than 24 hours. Uh, you uh, have no other alternative diagnosis, and you have an, a neurologist and also neuroimaging to confirm it. But um, so it's not just hemiplegia, hemiparesis, but we have to be uh, cognizant that sometimes it's the hemanopia. The patient says on the table, I don't see the left side or, you know, less uh, or amaurosis pulgax. So I think it's good to have a good relationship with your neurology and your radiology colleagues. Um, and, you know, also to uh, be uh, ready to assess the Rankin scale and also design the treatment plan because everything about uh, two is obviously disabling and with aggressive uh, treatment. Um, so in practice, uh, we talked about this already. I think uh, Sentinel is a very flexible, very nice device. It doesn't interfere with your procedure. But the key is to have CT imaging from uh, beforehand uh, to see that the arch is normal uh, or tortuous. But is it bovine? Is it luxoria where it makes sense to place the device? Uh, do it if you're going to do it. Do it in all cases, not just high risk, because the key is to have facility in it to um, be able to practice it um, and to also have a routine in your procedures to make sure that if you place it after you've obtained access, you give heparin prior to placing the device, and also that you don't forget to remove it before you give protamine, if you give protamine at the end of your procedure. And I think the more you do it, the better you are at it and the safer it is. So we also have a typical man, 83-year-old, with past history of atrial fibrillation, cabbage, uh, horizontal aorta, who um, uh, also received a sentinel device in a bovine uh, arch uh, from us. We saw, we did a CT scan uh, here, which showed some tortuous anatomy. But um, with this tortuous anatomy, and because we do it so much, uh, we could easily uh, place it within a couple of uh, minutes. Um, and you can see that the filters here are much closer to each other uh, than uh, you are normally maybe uh, used to uh, seeing. Uh, so if you want to be able to manipulate that and do that, uh, you should do it often. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah, so as, I, as we mentioned, no radial access, but perhaps brachial is an option. Um, uh, Luzoria, which is an anomalous right subclavian that courses behind the esophagus, and you can see it easily on the CT scan. Those are the impediments to placing the device. Um, and yeah, to summarize, um, this trial at this time will probably not change my practice, um, just because the stroke is such a horrible complication. Um, cost effectiveness may be an issue. Uh, in some countries it's not reimbursed, for instance in Canada as well. Number needed to treat is a bit high and I guess we're a little bit of our own enemy because we've gotten so good at preventing things that the rates uh, are lower. Um, you know, you need to balance uh, the decision um, of the cost of CVA over the years, especially in our young patients with the cost of the device. And I think this was very illustrative, uh, what was said in the panel at TCT by uh, David uh, Cohen. Uh, you know, would you like to have this device for your mother or father? And I think the, everybody in the panel 
And also at the FDL panel that approved the device said, well, you know, yes, of course I would. And it's certainly not an evidence-driven answer, but an emotional response. And I hope that in a couple of years we'll have the definitive answer. Thank you. Thank you, John. I think it's a, it's a clear presentation to, to see that you, you were probably fully convinced before and uh, it's, it has just had a little bit more for you to, 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 to recommend the use of Sentinel for, for all your patients. And I like the, the concept. That's what I say to the student. When you don't know why, what to do, just try to think that you are treating somebody from your family. It's not really robust and evidence-based, but usually it works, I think, in, a, in medicine. And uh, I would like to hear uh, Mohamed and Lars' view about uh, what will be the, the clear impact of the protective result in your uh, practice and the use of Sentinel as cerebral embryonic protection for your patient uh, since uh, the result were released at uh, at last TCT meeting. Lars, you can, maybe you can Yeah, talk. I mean, um, we have been using it, um, the device for quite a few years, and as I said, we used it in all patients who was, where it was anatomical feasible to do it before we joined the protective tower. After the last patient was uh, enrolled in January this year, we went back to that. So we are used it in 85, 90% of the patients. We're not going to change practice. Uh, I think it's a neutral uh, study with some, uh, at least uh, some indication that it's useful, particularly in order to reduce a disabling stroke. And then that's also my concern. What about these silent lesions? Are, are they really benign or? Are they also going to harm the patient in the long term? So unchanged in our practice. Thank you, Lars. Maybe, Mohamed, your view on that? We heard that Lars and Johanna will probably be, let's say, routine use of, uh, of Sentinel de device in interview patient. Yeah, in my practice, it, it was different and it is a bit different. So we, we never used it in all patients. We, uh, we couldn't for several reasons, including also reimbursement issues. And of course, after the trial, it's difficult to to um, to uh, to convince uh, people from this particular aspect that we have to increase our use now. So we 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 did not, and we will not. Um, maybe we are a bit more restrictive now, um, but it is difficult and the most challenging thing. And this is why using it routinely is probably a very easy thing because you don't have to think. And I like the trial also because we didn't have to think, but now we have to think and try to figure out something we really don't know, uh, which are the patients who have the highest stroke risk, because these in these patients, the number needed to treat will be far less, even less than the 77 that last showed. If the stroke risk is extremely high, if the risk of stroke is 10%, 15%, then we have a number needed to treat that is very low. But it's a challenge to identify these patients. I've shown some examples of what we think is a high risk, um, but it is a, a bit difficult. So it's uh, we're trying to balance, as I said, the the uh, the emotional part and the scientific part. The scientific, yeah, it's it, it will be, I think, exactly the same for us. And before it was a, a a selective use, and also as you said, Mohamed, it's the same for us, mainly for reimbursement issue that we cannot uh, propose that to to uh, to routine all, all the patients. And indeed, it, it's quite challenging to, to identify the, the good patient. So what we try to do is to keep the, the bike speed anatomy because we've seen still in registries that the rate of stroke is slightly higher. Uh, also, patient with more complex procedure in whom we will do predilatation, post-dilatation. So that could be also some uh, ateroma can also, uh, can also a, a good argument to do it. So maybe just to, to, to summarize the, the discussion we had in, uh, about maybe let's start with the clinical part to say that it's uh, an easy device to be, to be put in. We've seen that it's uh, less than two minutes in your hands, Mohamed, but I think it's, uh, it will be the same in, in many centers. It's uh, suitable in terms of anatomy for uh, more than 90 to 95% of the patients. So it's easy to use. It's suitable for almost all the patients and the rate of complication. We've seen that in protective it just one, one complication. So meaning that the rate of complication was very low. And on top of this, it was based on a very strong rationale. So we really 
uh, waited a lot from the protective result. And uh, unfortunately, we can say, for those of us we are convinced, it did not reach the primary endpoint, but it reached the secondary, which to us really makes sense in terms of, of clinical practice, because the disabling stroke is really the the, the complication we want to, to avoid in our in our practice. And on top of that, we can think about the the cognitive impairment uh, related to the subclinical uh, MRI uh, brain uh, injury. So we will have, I think, to, to think again, to work and to, to see maybe sub-analysis, although we did not identify clear subgroup. But also, I think the study coming from, from UK and meta-analysis of these two large studies might probably bring more evidence to make the use of, uh, of cerebral embryonic protection and mainly the, the Sentinel device more, more routine in our, in our practice. So just before uh, closing, I would like to thank the, the, the three of you, Mohamed, Lars, and uh, Joanna. It has been a, a great pleasure to do this webinar and to prepare it before uh, together. Thanks to the chat master. Thanks to Boston Scientific and to the old PCR team. And thanks especially to all of you who join us uh, today and you sent us a nice question. We had good interaction. So again, thank you very much and uh, see you very soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.